in your ear. He's going, you can't do it. You can't do it. You're a sinner. You ain't no good. You're never going to make it. Right? Little Satan. He's a little dude. Honestly, think of him that way. He's a little guy behind you. We got a big guy on this side. Big guy. God, right? And God's going, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Right? Amen? Remember that. And the, the actual verse that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So when the little saints go, you can't do it, you can't do it, you're a sinner. Well, guess what? Everybody's a sinner. The devil believes in God, right? God says, I don't remember your sins. How's that for one? You can't do it, you're a sinner. I don't remember that sin. So keep on trucking, right? But what do we do? Bing! Little Satan gone. How many angels does it take to bind Satan? One. How many angels are there? Wow. Alright, so just remember that. Uh, sorry for the building, cutting you off, but yeah. So my masked warriors today, we march into the enemy's camp. We take back what the devil tries to steal from us, amen. We take back the things he he's trying to take our strength, he's trying to take our love, he's trying to take our peace. And we don't give that to him. Bing! Sayonara, Satan. Uh, this song here, he says, I went to the enemy's camp. So, everybody walk in place. Look at me. You're walking. Where are you walking? You're walking to the enemy's camp. Okay? What are you going to do? And where is it? When I get to the enemy's camp, I took back. Everybody bend over. Come on. Take back. Again, bend over. The smell, you guys get to touch your toes? Look at me. Yeah, you gotta stretch, but you can't do yoga. <laughs> okay, so everybody walk. Come on, walk. David, you walk in. Now, bend over. Two back. You got it?
I play with my stuff. I got stuff that's mine. <laughs> but not everything's mine, some of it's yours. And one day all this will be yours. And everything else. We're gonna uh, slow down a little bit, calm our hearts for some worship. You know, it's really a uh, trying times we're in right now. It's uh, confusing and scary and hard. And, and you're all wearing masks. Whoever thought that would happen. But you know what? Under those masks, you're still God's warriors and you're still God's children. All of us, though. So, you know, just uh, pray. Pray for each other. Pray for our country. Pray for other countries. Because we're all in this one together. Amen. Amen.
Um, we had to cancel a lot of the activities because of this pandemic and um, WAC, WAC night, uh, the youth missions project, sports camp, um, also the annual fun days and the family camp. Um, all it is is just that, you know, yeah, we like to say cancel, but it's just postponed to next year, you know, postponed to next year at the same time. And so don't have to worry about that. It's not like we got rid of the program at tomorrow. It's just we want to make everybody feel safe during this time. Fire up here. Thank you. I see you, Tara. Again, we also like to invite you 15 minutes earlier every week for a come before church to pray for the service, our church, our community, and the nations during these challenging times. And now I'd like to talk about my new challenge for everybody. It's called, first it would give you was the awkward hug. Somebody thought that I was feeling sick, and I saw my friend one day, and I was like, and they're like, Rob, you okay? I was like, no, I, I was giving you a big hug, <laughs> but I couldn't hug you, you know, because it was awkward. And yesterday I was like, hey, Kara. She came, she came, she also, Kara also comes up on the market. Hey, Kara up there, yeah, Shiloh. And I was like, Kara, bring it in. Hug time, and then she went, and I'm like, oh, yeah. And I was like, so it's no longer an awkward hug because you know what I'm doing. So if I go by you and I go, oh, I'm actually hugging you, so please hug yourself back. You know, no shame, hug yourself back. Love you guys. Spread the love of God. Hello. Continuing in the letter of Ephesians this morning, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 to 14. So if you turn in, Ephesians chapter, chapter 5, verse 8 to 14. And the title of the message is, Let Your Light Shine. Now you'll notice that usually I close the service by saying, Go let your light shine. Why are you doing that? It's because that's really our mission. Our church's mission, stated in the back actually, is to reach out with God's love. And, and it's communicated through this theme verse, Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus explains the impact of kingdom people, people that believe in him, accept him, the impact of kingdom people, what their impact should be on the world. And so he says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. But what does that mean when I say that? Go let your light shine. I want us to take a look at uh, Paul's verses here in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 to 14. So if you follow along as I read that, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18, verse 8 to 14. It says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. For the fruit of life consists of all goodness and righteousness, truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes light. Then it's, this is why it's, it is said, Wake up, sleep, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. It is recorded in the Bible, one day Jesus took his disciples up to a mountaintop. High mountain with James, Peter, and John. And while Jesus was praying, his appearance changed. And his face began to glow like the sun, it tells us. And his clothes became as white as love. Imagine seeing it. And the disciples just fell on their face. We call that event the transfiguration. I think for a moment what Jesus did was allow his divine nature to just radiate through his body. And that's what the disciples saw. As Christians, though, 
we are to let uh, consistently let Jesus like shine through our lives. That's what Matthew chapter five is about. I'm going to read those verses again from verse fourteen. It says, "You are the light of the world." Jesus says, "You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house." So in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Jesus tells us, you are to let your light shine. Don't hide your light. Don't, but let it shine before all men. Jesus, the Bible tells us Jesus is the true light. John, writing in, in the Gospel of John, first chapter says, In Him was life, and that life was the light of me. When we come to Jesus, we accept Him as our Lord and Savior, we're given life, and we become light. Jesus lived a sinless life. He died on the cross to pay the penalty for all our sins. He was raised on the third day, proving that everything He said was true. And he lives today, he offers forgiveness and eternal life to all who believe in him and accept him as their Lord and Savior. We are the light to this darkened world around us. Ephesians 5a again says this, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light. I think in today's passage, Paul really helps us to better understand what it means to let your light shine. Christ is to shine through our lives. First of all, Christ's light shines through our actions. Paul calls this the fruit of light. The fruit of light. Look again in verse 8 and 9. For you were once darkness, actually the translation says this, for you were once darkness. Notice that, that that translation doesn't say we were in darkness, but we were actually darkness. For you were what's darkness, but now you are light. You were saved, and now you are light in the Lord. You're light in the Lord, that you're saved. And then it says live or walk as children of light. For the fruit of light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth. Your behavior, in other words, your behavior should match up to who you are in Christ. Your light, so your behavior should match up to that. And light produces fruit, and the fruit is what? Is goodness, righteousness, and truth. So we're going to look, uh, uh, take a little closer look at each one. Goodness is translated, also translated benevolence. Now we have a benevolence fund. We, every communion, we take this benevolence fund, we put a bowl in the bath, and if you have been blessed more than what you need, you, you give some to someone else who needs help. And first of all, that goes to those, to help those that are in need in our church, and then to those that are outside of our church. First our church and then those outside. Goodness really is love in action. In our behavior, we are to love others through our actions. And Jesus put it in Matthew 5, 16 this way. Let your light shine before men that they, they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in Him. Seeing our love in action, people will give praise to God. They'll turn to God. You know, in past generations, the church really took the lead in providing for the poor and, and the needy. They actually started schools, educated people. And we're supposed to continue that work today. We need to take that to heart. Let our light shine before men that they see our good works and glorify your Father who is in you. We're to have this outward focus of mission. We're to reach out to, to the world that's hurting and in need so that they might see the light of God. 
His love and through us then come to the saving knowledge through Jesus Christ. Throughout the gospel, we see that Jesus was about people and He was with people. He was about people and with people. He was with the poor and He was with the rich. He spent time with the young and He spent time with the old. He spent time with the sinners in need. And He spent time with the religious who were also in need. And many did not think they were in need. He had compassion on them. He cared for them. He touched them. He healed them. He forgave them. And at times, He challenged them and pushed them to a decision about Him. Jesus brought the light into the darkness of people's existence. And with love and in tangible ways, He reached out. And as Christians, we're supposed to do the same thing. Where do we get started? You can volunteer to spend time with someone lonely. Maybe visit an elderly person in the, in the nursing home. Someone that's been forgotten. Or like today, just give them a call. Sometimes you can serve in a soup kitchen. Get to know these people. Listen to their stories. Pray for them. You know, when I, when, when I think of that, I think of John Young. John Young is usually always at the soup kitchen. When we were open and we, we had seen, he would actually spend time with these people and talk to them. Seriously talk to them. He would get to know them and he would share the love of Jesus with them. And he was challenged them also to follow the Lord. Volunteer at a crisis pregnancy center. Encourage single moms to keep their babies rather than them born. Give a donation to the food pantry or the community food bank. Use your education or your professional training to help someone in need. You heard this uh, term, make a difference day. There, sometimes they have this make a difference day. Maybe we should have make a difference day at our church. You know, I'm excited because some of our Hanukkah groups are actually doing that. Helping to fix a fence or painting a house or doing yard work, dropping off food for someone in need, or giving a phone call to someone, sending a note of encouragement. That's the way that we let like Christ's light shine. And you know, you might think, well, I don't know what to do. Well, well what you do is you just and you let the Holy Spirit lead you to what He wants you to do, or show you the need. I have this vision, though, that something the church will be doing even more to reach out to those people. That we will be the light in, in the darkness of this community in Kapan. That we will be the light here. That, that people would feel the warmth of God's love through our church. And be given an opportunity to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord and to follow Him. That everyone in our church will know how to share Christ to someone. Share the gospel. How to lead them to faith and then how to help them to grow. Because we don't want to just be converts. We want to make disciples. So we have to follow up and help them. And I, I, I want everyone to know how to do that. That's our mission. That's what we're called to do. You know, we continue to have the soup kitchen twice a month now, but it's on a, on a takeout basis because of the pandemic. But they're just saying, give a man a fish and he'll eat for a day. Teach him how to fish and he'll eat for a life. I think about how we can do more to help these people. Not just give them a meal, but to help them to become self-sufficient. We want to do more than just feed them and clothe them. We want to help them to help themselves and give them the real answer in the process that's only found in Jesus Christ. I like to see how we could provide or help people to get counseling. Because there's many that are struggling. They have a serious problem. They don't know how to get out of what they're, they're into. So some kind of counseling, we can help them with that. 
or connected with some addiction recovery, some Bible-based addiction recovery program. Help them to connect to job training, uh, computer skills, apply, help them to apply for a job. Connect them to them. I believe that one way we can make a great difference in our, in our community is to start right in the elementary school. And we're actually doing that through our Common Grace program, where some of our people have met one hour a week with, with a child that's having difficulty in school whether it's home or, or different things. And, and all they do is spend an hour with them, they play with them, they read a book, which they're not even having done at home. They talk to them and spend time with them. Do they help those kids succeed in school? Because so that they're not failing in high school, I mean in middle school, and then dropping out in high school. And then they become a, a, pro, a, a part of the problem again when they become adults. And think about that. Maybe there's some kind of special talent or gift that you have or skill that God's blessed you with that can make a difference in someone's life. Maybe you've been an ed educator or you're a businessman or a social worker or you're a medical professional in some way. Whatever it is, could you give an army to help somebody in need? Or maybe you're retired and you have time on your hands. You know, there's no real retirement with the Lord. We don't get to retire. The fact is, if, if, if you're still here on earth, God still has something for you to do. In fact, you know, I think about some of the greatest accomplishments of people have happened late in their years. They didn't stop. We kept doing, and we can keep doing something to be the light. Jesus' light shines when we actively show love to someone else. Matthew 25, 35 and 36. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. James 1.27 Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James 2.15-17 Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If some, if one of you says to him, Go, I wish to well keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical need. He goes on to say this, What good is that? What good is that? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. Christ's light shines through our goodness, love, and action. And the second thing Paul talks about is that Christ's light shines through our righteousness. Righteousness refers to right actions as opposed to wrong actions. And, and I think about our society now, and our society is, is lost in this sea of morality. The boundaries between right and wrong seem to have blurred in our society. Personal rights and tolerance reign supreme. Truth has become relevant in our in our society. Whatever is right for you is right. In other words, whatever is true for you is true. It may not be true for me. George Barna, who's a Christian researcher, cited an alarming statistic among born again believers. He found out that two out of three say there is no absolute truth. I'm talking about Christians. Two out of three Christians say there is no absolute truth. We're living in this pluralistic society that says that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. 
Where does truth become by determined by what I believe? Truth is truth whether we believe it or not. Two plus two is always four. Whether you believe it or not. Psalm 119 says, All your words are true. The word is truth. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You know, evangelist Robbie Zachariah, um, who just passed away recently, he said he believed the West has become desensitized to moral issues. What once generated shock and revulsion when you heard those things. They only produce a difference. What else can I explain? I spoke out about this last week, the redefinition of sex. What else can I explain? What else can I explain? Transsexual restaurants. You can go to anyone you feel like. What else can I explain? The blatant portrayal in movies and television of was clearly sinful in scripture. You know, I read somewhere that the goal of the entertainment industry is to get people to laugh at what they would normally be appalled at. Get people to laugh about it first. And slowly move them closer to accept things that are out of the norm. The goal is to desensitize us, and it's working. It's working. Promiscuity is the norm today rather than the exception. Dishonesty and stealing are considered commonplace. You know what the recent high profile entertainers who paid large sums of money for someone else to take their children's SAT exam or to falsify their records and their sports and extracurricular activities, activities so they didn't get into a great college. People cheat on their income taxes. It used to be a waiter when they just got out of college. And, and waiters and waitresses were normally not playing all their tips. And it was the standard practice. We don't claim it all. Insurance companies invest, uh, are investigated for deliberately underpaying claims, and then they force their employees to destroy incriminating documents so that they can pay the lower claims. And if the employer refuses, they're fired. Loan officers encourage borrowers to lie on their income to obtain loans. That happened to me. Oh, just say you have that. It's okay. Paul tells us we're supposed to be different. We are to be righteous in our actions. We are to do what is right. That's what Paul is saying. You are light when you do what is right. So Christ's light shines for us when we do good, when we show our love in action, when we do what is right, and then third, by acting in truth. Act in truth. But how do you know what is right? How do you know what is right to do? You find that in the light of God's word. It's truth. Truth is conformity to the will and the word of God. Look again in verse 9. It says, The fruit of light consists of what? All goodness, righteousness, and truth. Romans 12, 2 says, and it tells us this, that we must transform or renew our minds by the light of God's Word. That's how we do it. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. And what does Ephesians 5 then says? And find out what pleases God. Find out what pleases God. 
To find out literally means to test and approve. Test and approve what pleases God. We learn what pleases God by the light of God's word. The Bible reveals God's will to us. We have to read it. We have to study it. We have to meditate upon it. And we need to ask God to help us to keep it. Because we can't keep it on our own. Then you'll know what is right to do. And you will do what is right. You know, light helps us in several ways. It helps us to see things more clearly. Remember when, when my kids were younger and they got a splinter. And I was trying to get that splinter out. I had to shed a strong light so I could see it. So I could see it closely and, and, and pull it out. God's Word is like that. It helps us to see things more clearly. It helps us to see things from God's perspective. And it's always the right perspective. Light helps us from, or keeps us from stumbling in the dark. You ever tried to walk through a dark room without the lights on? I try to do that at night. <laughs> it's not easy. Especially when someone moves something that you thought wasn't there before. <laughs> and you walk into it. God's Word warns us of impending danger so that we don't stumble and fall. This light like gives us direction. When we can't see clearly or know which way to go, it shows us. I find it difficult to drive sometimes up on a dimly lit road, and there's a lot of Kauai. Okay, the roads seem darker than when I was in Honolulu. And so sometimes I have to turn on the high beam so I can see where I'm going. Judy said, because my eyes are getting old. <laughs> God's Word gives us clear direction so that we know which way to go so that we can see clearly. It tells us what we should do. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Store for, for yourself treasures of heaven where moth and rust don't destroy. Seek and you shall find it. And all of those things, it tells us which way to go. We're supposed to let Christ's light shine through us so that people will feel the warmth of God's love and be led to Christ. In our homes, in our church, in our workplaces, and in our community. As we allow Christ's light to shine through us with the light of goodness and righteousness and truth, we will be helping others to see the light of Christ, which is the truth of the gospel. They'll notice a difference in our life and in our home and our church and they want to know what that is. It's going to expose the deeds of unrighteousness and show them their need for Christ. Jesus said, I have come as a light of the world that everyone who believes in me may not remain in darkness. You know, you never, you'll never know who you will touch. Or what God will do through this through a simple act of kindness. I think back. I just remember this. I did this memorial service uh, soon after I came to uh, Kapa Mission Church. And it was for a husband of a woman that was in the Queen Mission Church. Her husband had specifically asked me to do his memorial service before he died. I went to visit him and pray. I found out later that nine years earlier when I started the ministry at Lake Mission Church, his friend was dying. And he couldn't find a minister to do the service. And he was in charge of planning the service. I went to visit his friend in the hospital before he died, and I prayed with his friend. And I ended up doing this friend's service. That man never forgot what I did. And when he was dying, he told his wife, I want Pastor Jim 
to do my own work. So that's not the end. She wrote me a note after the memorial service. And one of the things she wrote was this. I do know that the seeds of him coming to Christ was planted nine years ago. When you went to visit his family in the hospital. You never know what's going to happen. When you, when you do something and, and show love and shine, God's love in the world. God's going to use that. So it was a joy for me to do that service because I knew that he knew for me. And it became the celebration. You never know who you're going to touch and what God is going to do through a simple act. So remember, you are the light of the world. Shine your light for all to see, that they might see your good works and turn to God. That's my message for you. Now, I'm going to pray. Actually, um, I'm going to pray for the offering to this moment. And then get me our bolts in the front and the back. And then worship people, would you start coming? Father, we thank you uh, this morning. We will come and to worship you. You've done so much for us. You've given us a new life. We are life. And your Holy Spirit in us. And we pray that you help us to be light to all those around us in this community. That we might touch them and lead them into your kingdom. That they might know you as their Lord and Savior. Thank you that you choose to use us. Help us to be your one in this community. And Father, as we give this morning, I just pray that you help us to give uh, just some of what you commanded us to give back to you for your work and for your glory that more and more people might be brought into your kingdom into a saving knowledge and eternal life. We thank you and we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name.
Will you stand? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for come together to worship you together, to serve you back together. And Father, as we <coughs> help us to be your life in our community and our families and you know, at our work, everywhere. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go let your light shine.